Heavenly Father, we pray and ask, Lord, that you grant David clarity as he reads the Bible for us. Please give us ears to hear you correctly and faith as we hear you speak. And please help our brother Nick as he preaches your word to us. Amen. Good morning and Happy New Year. Today's reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 8, and can be found on page 690 of the Church Bible. That's Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 8, on 690 of the Bibles that can be found in front of you. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, well, do keep Isaiah chapter 6 open. Um, I want to read verse 8 again, just as we start. We could have read the whole chapter, um, and you can carry on and read it, but we're going to focus on just 1 to 8. And v- verse 8, uh, Then Isaiah heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Uh, 2020, the start of a new year, a new decade. And when people say that, it sort of makes you feel you have to be doubly ready. You've got your plans in the diary, you've got your resolutions in place, you've got your target set because it's 2020. It's a big new year somehow. Um, I wonder how you're feeling about the year ahead. Um, I think for some people they do get excited, they're raring to go because they have their resolutions and their targets set. For some I think they're rather fearful, or perhaps worse, perhaps you're dreading the new year, you want to run away from it. Uh, Others I think are just a bit flat, never quite understood what all the hype is about the new year, it's just numbers, one day rolls into the next, as someone was saying, you kind of lose track of what day of the week it is, if you're like me. But how are you feeling about the year ahead? Wouldn't it be great as Christians and as a church to start a year with great excitement and great willingness and great confidence before God? That would be good if we could start a year like that, to start a year confident before God. You're sure you're okay with him and he's okay with you? To say like Isaiah, here I am, Lord. Let's go. I'm ready. And to start a year with keen excitement about serving him. To say like Isaiah, send me Lord, I'm longing for another year of following Jesus. I can't wait to serve him in all the multiple ways I could do at church. I want to be more godly this year in my character. Let's go, send me. 
It's actually quite easy to feel a bit flat about the new year, I think. Um, I tend to. Um, It's just partly the way I am, I suppose. I think it's intriguing, therefore, that here Isaiah is saying what many of us would love to be saying at the start of a new year. Here am I. Send me. I'm ready. I'm up for it. Let's go. That's true, of course. We're not Old Testament prophets. Um, Isaiah's experience here is unique to him in many ways because he's a prophet of the Old Testament in a way we are so not. But his vision of God that he's given was so that God's people would also see what he sees. So that God's people then and us today see the God that he sees. And we're going to do that this morning to see what Isaiah saw. And as we see the God Isaiah sees, we come to a place that he is in at the end of confidence before God and excitement and readiness to serve God. I take it you want to be there. I don't know what your first thought of God is, uh, what it would be at the moment. Um, This passage is absolutely foundational for our understanding of what God is like. Isaiah sees what I think many of us have forgotten, but which is fundamental in the truth about God. He sees, verse 3 is the summary of it, the Lord Almighty as supremely holy. So his first thought of God because of this vision is that God is holy, supremely holy. Look at verse 3 again. There are the seraphs, they're calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Our first stop thought of God is that he is holy. We've sung it already this morning, our first hymn. And not just any old holy, not just a bit holier than other things, but three times holy. Uh, The only time in the Bible is here where you get a three times repeated word to describe God. He is the holiest that you can possibly get. Uh, My guess is that when we think of the word holy, most of us will have to do a bit of reprogramming as to what holy is. Uh, Holy is not candlelit cloisters with reverend fathers chanting psalms and making sure no one's having fun. That is not holy. Holy essentially means different. The Lord Almighty is different in greatness and he is different in goodness. First one gives a bit of a flavor of the difference in greatness. Let's go back to the beginning of the chapter. It's the year that King Uzziah died. We're in real history. In other words, this isn't just a dream that Isaiah has. We're in the time before King Hezekiah. If you were with us last term, we spent some time around the time of Hezekiah. This is before that, and it's before Assyria has emerged as the superpower we talked about last week. And as one throne empties, Uzziah dies... Isaiah sees another throne, verse 1. I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted. This may be that Isaiah is having a vision of heaven. He sees this throne high and exalted, lifted up. So it's way above Isaiah and everything on the, on the world. And the Lord has, do you see, verse 1, a robe. But all that Isaiah sees of it is the bottom edge, the hem. That's what the word train means here. It's so vast and majestic, the hem, the tiny edge bit, that it fills the temple. God is so set apart and so other. He is so separate from. He is so supreme over all that he has created. I think sometimes Christians only live with the God of Christmas. They only think of God as close, personal, relating. And he is those things. And for God's people in Isaiah's time, he certainly was that because he was the Lord, L-O-R-D in capital letters. That's the, the relating God because it's the personal name of God, the rescuing God of his people who's in relationship with him. But for them to think simply of God as cosily with them and lovingly saving them, that would be a disaster, as indeed it was. 
it led them to become exactly like the world around them. So that as a witness to the world, they'd become totally useless. They were unfaithful to God. They had no desire to live for God. You may be in that place right at the moment. And all because they'd forgotten that their Savior, the Lord Almighty, that he was supreme and separate and other and high and exalted, that he was holy, holy, holy. And I think similarly for us today, the incarnation of the Christmas accounts, that is only extraordinary if you first know the God who is holy, holy, holy. Otherwise, it's very ordinary. It's remarkable that when um, the Apostle John writes his account of Jesus' life and death and resurrection, he quotes Isaiah 6 in a chunk where Jesus is faced with opposition in John chapter 12. And he says that Isaiah saw, get this, Jesus' glory. So the supreme holiness of God, the one who is high and exalted and holy, 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 that's accessible and visible and seen in Jesus of Nazareth. So this holiness, verse 1, means difference in greatness from us and difference, too, in goodness. And verse 2 gives a sense of that. Let's look at verse 2. Because above him were seraphs, heavenly beings, literally burning ones, each with six wings. And with two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, And with two, they were flying. So these are the burning ones around God's throne. And they cover up their faces faces because they can't look at the holiness of God. They cover up their feet. Maybe that's because they're not worthy to serve this God. And all they're doing is declaring to one another the holiness of the Lord Almighty. You'll have been following the fires in New South Wales in Victoria and guess feeling like most people of how frightening those fires are Um, it seems to be an escalating situation I just can't comprehend how ferocious they must be and when you hear of those who have died because of these fires you just sort of wonder well I wonder how, how can flames be so strong and vicious and hot that people don't escape in time I, I don't understand I, I can't fathom it it's horrific The intensity of those fires gives a glimpse of the intensity of God's holiness. Because in Isaiah 6, seraphs, burning ones, flames themselves cover up before the holiness of God. Here is supreme moral perfection. All that is good and always good separate from all impurity. Here is God full of righteousness and full of goodness and empty of corruption and empty of any evil, totally different in goodness. And your readiness and my readiness this year to keep being a Christian and to keep following Jesus and keep serving Jesus begins with seeing God in his supreme holiness. If he's only like us, or a slightly better version of us, he is not worth our time. I suspect for many Christians, God has been domesticated. That God has been tamed to something he is not. And our God is too small, and he's too close, and he is too like us. As one writer was describing the kind of loss of understanding of God's holiness... And he describes how until we recognize afresh how vital and central God's holiness is, our belief will lack poignancy, it'll lack impact, our practice will lack impact in the world, and church, that'll just become one more vying attention interest for our already busy lives. God is holy, he writes, and we place ourselves in great peril if we render him a plaything in our piety, or an ornamental decoration in our religious life, a product to answer our dissatisfaction. God offers himself on his own terms or not at all. 
the Lord Almighty is supremely holy. And that must be your thought and my first thought for 2020. This is the God who has reached down to us whom we serve. Now for Isaiah, it means a sequence of things after verse 4. It means that he immediately has to admit his uncleanness. Just look at verse 5, uh, read helpfully for us. Verse 5, the temple is now shaking and it is filling with smoke. Verse 5, Isaiah says, Woe to me, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. So this vision of God, it doesn't just blow his mind, it nails his conscience. If God is holy like this, then he is intensely unapproachable. And so Isaiah says of himself that he's ruined, he's literally silenced to death. And a genuine encounter with God, a genuine encounter with God, will lead to a very real awareness of uncleanness. It is funny, isn't it, how people describe encounters with God and so often their response is, wow, how amazing everything is. Whereas in the Bible, more often than not, you encounter God, your response is, whoa, how terrible I am. Think of Peter with Jesus and the catch of miraculous fish, masses of fish. Jesus didn't then say, well, hey, Jesus, let's go into business together. No, he said, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Real encounter with the real God leads to acute awareness of uncleanness. And for Isaiah, do you see, it's not just general conviction because he knows that's the right thing to say. He's aware of specific sin in verse 5. I'm a man of unclean lips. That's a big thing for a prophet to say. Words, lips, that's your life's work. And he finds himself saying, my goodness, I'm of unclean lips. Maybe his words had become Slightly resentful because his ministry wasn't going well. Slightly self-pitying. Slightly tired. Maybe he was grumbling. Who knows? But you and I similarly need to admit specific uncleanness. Maybe it is your words. Maybe you're hurting and so you've become complaining because nothing is quite right in life. Maybe it's your thoughts. You've drifted into immorality. You've allowed things just because your spouse can't see them. Maybe it's values that have become just like the world, especially over Christmas time. You've been with non-Christian relatives. And you think you have a right to a certain standard of living or whatever it might be. That word unclean is the cry of the leper. He, he cannot approach other people. And so for us with any sin, we cannot approach God in his supreme holiness. We are worse off than a town in New South Wales surrounded by walls of flame. So begin the year rightly by admitting your uncleanness. I wonder if you can echo Isaiah's words at all when he says, woe to me. We must be quick to admit, that is to spell out to God specific uncleanness. Woe to me, I'm a woman of unclean ambitions. Woe to me, I am a man of unclean motivations. I heard of a church that um, once preached a series on all the people God had killed in the Bible. Get that. We're not going to do that here, don't worry. Because of his holiness. That's to say those who'd offered unauthorized sacrifice in Leviticus, those who'd looked at the Ark of the Covenant in 1 Samuel, who'd even touched it to Samuel. And over the weeks, apparently in this church, the congregation saw God's holiness and their reaction changed from, you know, when you read someone who's killed by God in the Bible, why them? Their reaction changed to, why not me? Because they saw the holiness of God. If you have no sense of saying, woe is me, it's been too long since you've seen the holiness of God. And maybe you've lived your Christian life dwelling only and ever on the grace and the love of God. But as you think of it, even that's become a bit like diluted squash. It just tastes of nothing anymore. Maybe the Christmas wonder of God coming low means you've forgotten. He is also high. 
and exalted. Maybe God being with us means you've forgotten he's utterly different from us. Because if you have no sense at all of your uncleanness before God, then he's become domesticated. He's too normal, too unremarkable, too weightless, too much like you. Perhaps you've become so like the neighbors and the unbelieving family. Perhaps you've resented being a Christian. Perhaps you've simply not been in God's word in the last two weeks because of all the change routine of Christmas and New Year. The Lord Almighty is supremely holy, so we must admit our uncleanness before him. And only then can we, verse 6 and 7, receive his mercy. Just look at verse 6 again. What do you suppose Isaiah is thinking as verse 6 happens? Then one of the burning ones flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he'd taken with tongs from the altar. What do you think is going to happen as that happens? One of the seraphs flying towards him, burning coal in his hand. He's bringing it towards Isaiah's mouth. I think Isaiah's going to be burnt up. That's what happens to sinfulness in the presence of holiness. But then you look, see, this coal, though, has come from the altar. That is the place of sacrifice. It's from a fire that has already burnt up a sacrifice on the altar. And so when that fire comes to Isaiah, it doesn't bring judgment. It brings, what you see, verse 7, it brings cleansing. With it, he touched my mouth. That's extraordinary. And he said, see, this has touched your lips. Result, your guilt is taken away and your sin is is atoned for. Do you see how Isaiah does nothing in verse 7? He doesn't collect the coal. He doesn't have to bring the coal and apply it to his own lips. This is all God's seraph acting on him. He's the one who does it. And at that point, verse 7, there is atonement. There is a paying of what's required. It's a personal atonement. It's applied to the lips, the very thing that Isaiah was convicted about earlier. That's to say God wants to Apply his atonement to whatever it is you're most ashamed as you begin the new year. He wants to clean you of that. It's personal, this atonement. It's a total atonement. The second half of seven, do you see? Your sins are atoned for, but just before that, your guilt is taken away. Sometimes we believe sin is dealt with, and it's a slightly calculated and mechanical transaction. Our guilt is taken away. It's also a costly atonement because that word speaks of a sacrifice burnt in the place of a sinner. The holy anger is borne by another. We speak in our Lord's Supper service of propitiation. The holy wrath of God being borne by another. Same principle as a lightning conductor. At the top of the building you sometimes have a lightning conductor. It might be a piece of copper or something like that which is there to save the building from any stray lightning. As lightning strikes, it's drawn to the conductor, taken safely away, as it were. And that's what God's doing in providing the sacrificial system. A sacrifice was offered in the place of the sinner. The animal drew away from the sinner the judgment of God they deserved, so they'd be safe. There's no altar now, of course. That's not an altar there's no coal that we have to pass around now, of course. Those sacrifices were pictures of the Lord Jesus. We're going to see Isaiah speak of him a lot this term in Isaiah 40, following the servant who will come, the ultimate sacrifice who stands in the place of sinners. Sometimes sing those words of Jesus on the cross, don't we, in that song, it is finished, the payment is made. Salvation is achieved, so salvation must now be received. He's achieved it, you and I must receive it, receive his mercy. And that is real Christian experience. Whatever anyone else tells you, whatever any other Christian tells you, real Christian experience is to admit uncleanness, personally and specifically, and then receive the mercy of God at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the way to begin 2020. This week, 
uh, may see you start back with lots of new things, new terms, new routines, those daily patterns again. And we need to admit our weakness and receive his mercy. Before we write any lists, before we organize any diaries, we admit our uncleanness and receive his mercy before our holy God. And only then, verse 8, are we to prepare to serve him. And just as we finish, I wonder if this may be the most encouraging part of the passage for some of us, because some will assume here that our sin, our uncleanness, well, it writes us off. We've got no part in God's purposes if we're like that. And yet, the opposite is true. God uses those very people. It's the astonishing kindness of God, isn't it, that Isaiah, who was so conscious of his utter uncleanness before him, is then employed by God for God's purposes in the world. That's extraordinary. And this year, it is not the sorted churches that God will use. It is not the together well-behaved Christians that God will use. It is the unclean who are cleansed that God will use. It's cleansing from God that readies a person for service of God. Those who've admitted their uncleanness and received his mercy. And as we go and serve, which wasn't an encouraging experience for Isaiah, by the way. We may not see all joy and light this year. Very discouraging for Isaiah. But as we serve, the holy God that we've encountered is exactly the God that the world needs. We don't dumb down his holiness because, well, this is an evangelistic situation. We must give the world a God who is holy and worth worshipping because he's so unlike us. A God who is full of holy wrath and full of loving mercy. There's a pastor in the US called Kevin DeYoung who writes this very helpfully. We must give the world a God who is sovereign and tender. It's a good combination, isn't it? Sovereign and tender. A God, as he describes, who is undiluted. He goes on. A God who makes people feel cherished and uncomfortable. A God who's worthy of our wonder and our fear. A God who is big enough for all our faith and all our hope and all our love. The supremely holy Lord Almighty. So when Isaiah says in verse 8, here am I, send me, that is not the cry of cockiness or presumption. It's the cry of quiet confidence in the mercy of God. It's a heart that's retuned to a God of supreme holiness. A heart conscious of sin and confident of God's mercy and so ready to serve whatever the Lord should bring. May we be as he was for this coming year.